uh, yeah, and as you just mentioned, your next feature film went on to what I, I would argue is one of the best kept secrets of Disney animation, Atlantis, The Lost Empire. Where did yeah. the first idea for such a story come about? Well, I mean, at this at this restaurant, um, we, um, we 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 all kind of said, okay, we've done we've done a couple musicals, we did okay, um, and Disney very much you know was in this pattern of doing the Broadway musical uh, formula, you know, because they were they were doing well, we did Beauty, then there was Aladdin, then there was Hunchback, then there was Pocahontas, and you know, you know it's like all of these. That was the formula. That was success. And Disney, you know, Disney loves success. So they wanted to do that. And we said, you know, not only are we getting a little weary of this formula, we think the audiences are going to get kind of tired of it as well. It's like, oh, it's another, another Whoops. Disney musical. It's like, okay, I guess we'll watch it. We'll take the kids and dump them off. But we wanted to do something else. We want to do something um, different and preferably without songs. And um, was that decided early on? Because I was going to ask you about that. Did you decide you were done with musicals for a while or? Yeah, we did. That, that came pretty early. And that, that was like the four of us. We said, yeah, you know, honestly, all things considered, songs have been very good to us. Musicals have been very good to us. But the company's doing a lot of musicals. And <laughs> I just don't know if we want to do another musical. It's going to be more of the same. Can we try something different? And you know, like kind of wake people up again. And it was around that time that we said, maybe, you know, those those old Disney uh, live action things from like the 50s and 60s, you know, the uh, Swiss Family Robinson and and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and, you know, all, all those like really cool action adventure things from from that time. What if we did an animated version of that? I mean, it's it's in the Disney canon. We can, it's, we can point and say, look, Walt Disney did the, you know, and, and um, I believe it was, it was either Kirk or Don that said, we can use the, um, the analogy that when you go to Disneyland and you're walking down the main street and right ahead is the, is the castle, the Sleeping Beauty's castle. And you go straight through that, which is what we've been doing for the last 50 years. And you're into fantasy land. But if we hung a left at the, you know, at the circle there, you're in Adventureland, and we want to go to Adventureland this time, and that's kind of what's that's kind of what sold us with the executives was that analogy. It's like we're not straying away from Disney; we're just going to, we're going to a different land in Disney. So you know that's that's how we were able to to kind of um, that was our Jedi mind trick. Now, even then, without it being a musical. Um, Without the score that James Newton Howard created for you guys for the film, I, I would think the movie would probably lose a lot of its magic and mystique. Absolutely. How important did you think the score was going to be for the film? And when did James Newton Howard come on board? Um, I mean, we always knew that that music was important. I mean, me being like the least musical person on earth, even I know that that music, the the right music can elevate a scene amazingly you know amazingly well just as bad music can ruin it and um i just saw recently there was a it was a scene from star wars i think it was like darth vader is like walking in to uh you know to the to this area on the on the on his giant imperial cruiser and his generals are looking like kind of nervous and apprehensive and they changed it from the darth vader music to like some kind of love story theme and it totally changed it. It was like, suddenly they're like anticipating something kind of nice here. And it was like, it was hilarious, but that's what music can do. You know, it's like you get different music and it can, it can really change things. So we knew that music was going to be a huge part of this. And even, even our, our temp music, we were like really careful and really worked hard, you know, with our music editors and our editors, like, let's get something in here that really helps this theme. And so when we, when we got James in, it's like, okay, here's, here's what we want to do. Unfortunately, he was, you know, way better than, than us and said, you know, okay, I, I, I gotcha. Uh, just let, let me do this. Let him and, just let him do his thing. And then, yeah, let him do his thing. And like, for instance, the crystal chamber music, it was like, he, I think he mentioned to us, yeah, I, I kind of have this, you know, 
slightly more uh slightly more tribal but but not quite tribal and a little bit mystical but you know orchestral and we're like oh yeah okay whatever <laughs> go do it and and he came back with that that music that is you know arguably some of the best in the film how did you decide on the incredible art style for atlantis because to me it's one of the most beautiful 2d animated films made well we wanted something at, at that time um there was a lot of a lot of digital animation was, was starting to catch on you know and 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 it has that you know that real rounded and airbrushed and photorealistic look to it that honestly when you when you look at it you know from film to film to film to film it all kind of looks the same regardless of the graphic language you get this you know beautiful photorealistic lighting and and shading and it's like okay yeah whatever and we wanted to go opposite that we wanted to make it look like an illustration you know a, a, a not even a painting you know a painterly painting like when when we did beauty brian's uh brian's assessment of that was i want it to be like bambi but with interiors and so there was a lot of that you know that kind of french uh the french renaissance you know the the shading and the, and the blocks of colors and, and we said like a no, moving painting be, what's that like a moving painting right exactly but we wanted it to, we wanted number one for the character we knew the characters were going to be flat that's just the thing with 2d but we said if we can do that with the with the backgrounds as well and we we found some uh some turn of the century painters um that that used gradations of color rather than blends of color you know so it looked like almost like like cut paper on on top of each other to give it a flat look in the backgrounds but still give it dimension and you know a, a beautiful uh, palette and then you could put your your uh your flat character on that and the character worked with the background much better and kirk and i were both huge fans of mike mignola and hellboy and we said this would be so cool because we liked his graphic style, you know, his boldness, his use of black, um, you know, his design sense. We, we just, both of us were, you know, really loved it. And so we contacted him and evidently he was really surprised. He's like, what, <laughs> how'd you get my number? But, um, <laughs> but he, uh, you know, he came through and, and he had some really great story ideas as well. So, um, yeah, it, it was that was a big win for us. Well, and I don't remember myself seeing anything exactly quite like it before. Was it kind of a new art style or drawing style at the time, or was it something that had been dabbled with but just never put on that scale? But that that particular style for yeah. Atlantis. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, the closest you could probably come um, was like the Ivan Earl uh, inspired work in. Uh, um, Sleeping Beauty, you know, just the, the the big shapes and you know, kind of his color treatment. But this was a lot more flat, a lot more comic book and and uh, you know, illustrative than than painted. So, and we even had um, kind of uh, classes for the for the animators, you know, like how to draw Mike Mignola hands. You know, there here's the hand, but the the fingers are squared off. The fingernails are more triangular or you know, more blocky. They're not round with a little cuticle and so yeah it was it was a whole a, a whole learning process for everybody to like get that new style how did you guys decide on the opening five minutes of the film because t to me it's one of the more thrilling dynamic kind of otherworldly openings i've seen <laughs> it kind of feels like you went from zero to a hundred in a nanosecond and then back right back. um originally and if you've seen the uh um i think the 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 dvd with like the the extras you know the the added stuff you you can see the original opening which was we had a viking ship um you know like like growing out and and the the captain of the ship had the shepherd's journal and was speaking in icelandic which we were told by our linguist was the closest you know to uh in what the Vi we, we thought it would be but like like norwegian yeah and he said now when the vikings went when the vikings went and colonized iceland they pretty much stayed there and that was the language that was spoken, you know, the, the mm. language the Vikings spoke went to Iceland and stayed that way basically until World War II because nobody went there. And so the language didn't wow. have all these other influences coming at it. 
until World War II when the U.S. set up a, you know, a radar base there. So we had every Icelandic actor in Los Angeles, all three of them, um, in, you know, doing these Viking voices. And they, you know, they went home after the first night and were like calling their grandparents, like, okay, how would you say this? And what, what's the phrase for that? So, <clears throat> so it was pretty, you know, pretty authentic as far as like old Icelandic slash Viking. Um, so these Vikings were out on the high sea with this, with this shepherd's journal and they get taken down by the Leviathan, you know, the, the still guarding the portal and it, and it, you know, took them down and we end with a floating book and then we wipe to, uh, um, to the Smithsonian and that's entirely animated, entirely in color. It's done. You know, it was, we were like ready to cut it on. And John Sanford, who was our head of story said, this is, it's something's, something's wrong here. You know, it's, it's just not connecting. You know, we, we don't really care about the, we don't really care about the Vikings. We don't get to Atlantis till about a half an hour in, and we don't see any of the Atlanteans. This is their story too. This is their problem. And we, there's nothing to connect us. You know, we need to, so that, that was his idea to bring them into the beginning of the film, but we didn't really know how. I had an idea. It's like, okay, I, th I think I know what to do. I, uh, you're going to love this. Um, I went to a strip club and, and boarded the whole thing out on a napkin. And, uh, you know, in, in that one night, and came back with it the next day. And we gave it, I think, to Todd Kurosawa. And he boarded it out beautifully. And that, that, became, the, uh, that, that became the opening. Now, and we, and we had said, let it be the last day. You know, it's, it's the last day of Atlantis. And what happens then? Do you think the pendulum will ever swing back towards 2D animation? Is there like a, a piece of technology on the horizon that can make 2D more cost effective? So studios will start making tentpole 2D films again? Or has, the, has, has that ship sailed? So hard to tell. Um, I mentioned I mentioned earlier that that after a while a lot of the uh, a lot of the 3D digital stuff looks the same and when i was at dreamworks they had a uh, they they had a little conference day you know like an an off campus conference where they had like directors producers executives etc and talking about how can how can we stand out from the crowd how can we make things look different and they had put together um a, a little reel of like 30 second clips of all the animated uh, features from like that year and the year before and, you know, what was coming out. And I mean, this was a few years ago, but everything, like I said, it, it all looked the same. Cookie cutter. Graphic language was different. So you'd have something like Madagascar and then you'd have something like Shrek. Then you'd have something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And, you know, so the very different graphic styles, but again, it's like, there's that lighting, there's that shading, there's that photorealism. It's like, yeah, it's just all blending together. And then what really popped was the Simpsons movie. And everybody went, doink, yeah, that, you know, and, and that's what really stood out. And of course, you know, they, they completely ignored the advice and went back to, you know, 3D shading. But but yeah, it, it, really, it really popped out. You know, it really stood apart from all the rest. And I got to hope that, you know, someday they'll do that. When, when Ron and John did Princess and the Frog, I thought, okay, maybe, you know, may, maybe this will catch on, but I guess it is still kind of prohibitively expensive and people still like that 2D or that 3D look. But then you see things like, um, you know, like Arcane come out, you know, and that's like, that's got a whole different look to it. Or Klaus, which is the 2D, 3D uh, um, hybrid that was gorgeous. So I have hope. Do you think it's even possible to have another movie like Atlantis or Hunchback made? I mean, I, I don't think Disney's killed anyone in an animated film in quite some time. Uh, much less had a, much, much less. So we got some time to yeah, make up for. It. Much less, much less had a villain anywhere close to to Claude Frollo. I mean, sure, anything is possible, as they say, in an infinite universe, all things are possible. But um, honestly, at this point, I don't really see it. But I don't know, Gary. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, sure, it's my pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Truesdale.